I am often asked to advise companies on how to do a better job of software development. There are obviously lots of things that can go wrong with something as complicated as software development, but the two commonest causes of problems that I see are an over-reliance on manual testing and the topic of today's episode, getting the requirements wrong in the first place. So why are the requirements so problematic? And what can we do to fix them? And what is the point of user stories anyway? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. If you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Equal Experts, Octopus, Tricentis, and Transfic. They've been supporting our channel for a while, so please do support them in turn by checking out their links in the description below. If you'd like to learn more about user stories and how they can help you to take the next step to executable specifications, I've got a new training course coming out soon. Check out the links below for more details. And while you're there, also check out our great summer sale on our current course lineup. Software development is structured around three activities, deciding on what we want, building it, and verifying that what we build does what we want. To do a good job of all of these things then, it's important to get a good start by communicating effectively what it is that we want our software to do. This shapes everything else that we do, really. If we get this wrong, it can make it difficult or even impossible to do a good job. I think that most teams that build software these days would think of themselves as applying an agile approach, and so nearly everyone talks about defining requirements in terms of user stories. Some people argue that user stories aren't the same thing as requirements. I confess that I've said stuff like this myself in the past. But actually, I think that I was and they are mistaken. It's not that user stories aren't requirements, but rather that so many teams' approach to requirements is so wrong to the extent that we've done something that we often seem to do in software. We've redefined the term. The common use of the term requirements in software doesn't match what the word or even our own definitions of it say it means. In software, we often think of requirements as big, complex, implementation-focused descriptions of how a system should work, a kind of painting-by-numbers description of how to build the system. This is a complete misrepresentation of the idea of a requirement. Here's how the IEEE defines them. A condition or capability needed by a user to solve a problem or achieve an objective. I'm pretty happy with that. It aligns very well with how I think about things. To guide our work, we need a description, ideally a brief description, of what we need our software to do. Please note that this definition leaves very little room to misinterpret this to mean a detailed description of how to solve some unstated problem which is what most requirements that I see look like. If your requirements prescribe how the system works, they aren't really requirements at all. I see lots of organisations that by my and IEEE's definition don't have any requirements at all, or at least none that are communicated to the development teams. Instead, they have collections of what are effectively high-level descriptions of a solution. The dev team don't get off the hook here, though. This isn't about a rant about evil product owners. As usual, it's a bit more complicated than that. Dev teams are often complicit in this thinking. I've seen development teams refuse work on a feature unless it is more precisely specified. This often happens in junior teams who are feeling a little bit lost uh, and in bureaucratic organisations where it's really more about ass covering than doing a good job making sure that no blame can stick because we're doing what we're told. Let's clear the decks and get one bad idea off the table here. Unless you're working on a deeply constrained, unusual kind of problem where you're interfacing to a technical, well-defined communication protocol of some kind, no one knows what the requirements are. They're all just guesses. It's common for dev teams to bemoan software failures and blame the failure on somewhere else. If only they'd told us what they really wanted. But they, whoever they are, can't tell us what they want because they don't know what they want. At least, not in enough detail to implement a software system. 
in reality, our job and the whole process of software development really is to translate vague wishes into a sufficiently concrete description that it can execute on a computer. This is all that a computer program is. So the only way for our users or our product owners or whoever to precisely specify what they need is to write the code for themselves. And that's kind of what great teams do. Great development teams own the responsibility, not just for the technicalities, but for the products that they build too. They may be informed by people who understand the problem better, but they understand the problem and steer the development and direction of the product as a team based on that understanding. None of this means that we shouldn't listen to our users, but rather that we shouldn't assume that they know what it is that they want, other than in vague general terms. It's an illusion that anyone really knows that the requirement, what the requirements are, so there's not much point blaming product owners or users for not knowing what they want or for changing their minds once they've seen our latest creation. That simply is the game that we are in. So the job of the requirements process is to begin this process of translation from a vague wish into something that works on a computer. Not by attempting to solve it in a single step though, but first making sure that we're clear about what users want as far as we and they understand it. Our job is to explore the problems that we are trying to solve and leave ourselves free to try out different solutions when we find better ways or our users dislike our early attempts. What all this really means is that it's really a terrible idea to fall into the alluring trap of rigidly fixing the requirements process to the solution. These should be treated as two distinctly separate steps on the journey of translation from wishes to working software. We separate what the system needs to do from how it actually does it. We will still get the what wrong sometimes, but usually, mostly, if we're cautious in how we express the what, it is the how that is more painful to change. So if we focus on describing only what in our requirements and immediately jump on, the, on any sign uh, that we're describing how rather than what and eradicate it, we will give ourselves a better chance of being able to change the how when we need to. If our aim is to build better software faster, this is a very important thing to get right. User stories are an effective way to fix this problem, but you still need to understand where their real value lies. I think that the idea of user stories is a kind of shortcut to this bigger idea. It's an effective, extremely valuable shortcut, but the other idea is still bigger. A few years ago, I was working with a team that was building some low-level software for a complex hardware system. They were building the firmware and device driver layers of code for a scientific instrument. At one point, the tech lead said, user stories don't work for us. He went on to explain that the bulk of their work was on a single user story. The user pressed a button, the machine ran through a calibration sequence that took six hours and represented three years worth of software development. Fair enough, this rather challenged some of my assumptions. Then and now I generally start from the assumption that you can always find a story if you look hard enough. Even after this experience, I still hold this view. I think that my friend, the tech lead, was partly wrong and partly right. If you think from the perspective of the user, you will end up with a better design. But what many developers and de development teams do at this point is to take a rather technical view of what it means to focus on what the user wants. They don't really think about the user. I think they think about the user interface, and this is wrong. Our aim is to tell stories about a user's goals and only then figure out how to meet those goals. So let's carry on with our scientific black box as an example. At the point when the user walks up to this device, they aren't thinking, I want to push the initialization button to start calibration. They're really thinking, I want to use the machine to do some work. 
Pushing the initialization button is an annoying side effect, really, an implementation detail that is forced on them by some technical constraints, presumably. The constraints are probably real, but my first thought, if I'm thinking from a user's perspective, is I bet they'd like our system more if it didn't take so long to get going. We are imposing something on our users that none of them really want. So my user focus has started me wondering if I could shorten this calibration time. Let's put that aside for now. Let's imagine that you are the user. You walk up to the machine, press the button, and then head off to go surfing while the machine starts up. Six hours later, you return and the machine isn't running. You didn't press the button properly. Oh, that would be a terrible design. Given the way that the machine works necessitates this long startup, as a user, I'd at least like some feedback that the calibration sequence had started properly when I pressed the button and before I got my surfboard out. So now we have a user need that we can use to inform our design. As a surfing scientist, I'd like to be able to start calibration to get, and get confirmation that calibration is underway so that I can go surfing. If the calibration process takes six hours, we can be pretty sure that there's a lot going on. Six hours of work for a modern computer is a lot of work. If we think about this from our user's perspective again, it's pretty clear that we can think of lots of examples, stories about stuff going wrong, for example, that would inform our design choices. And soon, as we start thinking like this, it also challenges some of our assumptions about our design, perhaps. Let's take our Tech League statement at face value. In reality, the team had done some of this thinking, of course, they just hadn't thought of it in terms of user stories. Six hours of work. Obviously, the system was running through a lot of steps. Once the process was started, sure, there wasn't any, use, any more user input, but we can certainly imagine scenarios, stories about times when some output would be nice. I go for coffee and come back and find that the startup failed because I forgot to add the correct carefully measured calibration sample. If that is our story, our job as a development team is to figure out how to inform our user that the sample was wrong and maybe decide how they should progress from here or if they got to go back to the beginning and start all over again. This defines how our system interacts with our user. Again, from a user's perspective, it would be really nice to know if the calibration failed early. If I'm off surfing for the day, but the calibration failed 10 minutes after I left, my boss is going to be pretty angry because I could have spent the time fixing the problem instead of catching waves. How much nicer if there is a way that I could monitor progress or be informed of failures? We don't need to say anything about how any of this works. But knowing that it's something that would be useful to our users is what gets software developers thinking about what is needed and ways of solving this problem. The idea of a user story is not to define a user interface. More, it is to define the user's mental model of the context of the system. When I approach the system, what is my goal? When the system is working, what do I need to be aware of? When the system fails, what do I need to know and what do I need to be able to do to carry on? These are all what questions and none of them do or should say anything at all about how the system actually works. This user focus is a fantastically effective tool at making us take this external perspective. But as soon as we ignore this deeper meaning, we lose nearly all of the value of user stories. Thinking of user visible outcomes focuses us on our real goals. So we end up with a better chance of describing effective requirements that leave us free to later think about lots of different solutions that may fit those requirements. User stories are a kind of trick to force us to separate thinking about what from thinking about how. So the real difference here is less about stories versus requirements and much more about requirements versus bad requirements. So that's the user bit. What about the stories? I think of this in a more literal terms than many people seem to. The stories in our user stories are literally stories about the use of the system. One day, Joe came and bought a book called Modern Software Engineering. That's a story. OK, it may not be a very exciting story, but the real goal here is to put the need that the story expresses into context. 
It's like a real story. It has characters, the people who will gain if we add this, the thing that they need. It has a title so that we can talk about it and maybe even recommend it to our friends. It has a narrative, the explanation that describes the context and the need. And it has a resolution, ways in which we can see that everything worked out well in the end. When we get this right, our stories are more durable. In fact, they don't change until our view of what the user wants changes. By focusing on the outcomes that our users want and using their language to capture these outcomes, we're communicating in language that is or should be accessible to everyone. Non-technical people get a clearer view of what each story means so that they have a clearer view of where the project stands and what needs to be done for the users. A common side effect of this improved clarity is that it's easier for these people to see ways to cut scope and better prioritise work. Technical people get a better view of the context too. This means that they can have more effective, more useful conversations with non-technical people. It means that their understanding of the problem that they're trying to solve with their software deepens over time. And this gives them more freedom to pick the most appropriate solution at any time. To write great software, developers need a good description of what we need the software to do. The best way to do this is with succinct user stories, not long-winded technical requirements. User stories describe what a user wants the software to do. Good user stories don't include technical specifications, so eliminate any idea that is specific to your system. No mention of databases, input fields, or even clicking buttons. If you think you have written a good user story, test it out. Imagine a completely different system delivering the same outcome for the customer. Does your story still make sense for a, for a voice or even a thought-controlled system? Use language that a non-technical person can understand. Imagine asking or ask somebody who understands the problem but knows nothing about your system to read your story. Would it still make sense to them? The goal of user stories is to be intentionally, deliberately high level. A good user story is accurate enough to capture the goal and vague enough to allow lots of different ways to achieve the goal. Thank you very much for watching.